Hi there, and welcome to my brand new show. My name is Ben, and I'm an IT consultant specialising in security, identity and privacy. And today I'd like to spend five minutes describing OAuth and OpenID Connect. Let's start by looking at OAuth. This is an authorization protocol. The OAuth authorization protocol was designed to allow a user to grant a third-party website access to protected resources without revealing their credentials or even their identity. The important part here is that identity is not a component of this protocol. Initial use cases included allowing a website to post to your Facebook feed without having to disclose your password. Your identity was irrelevant to the scenario. Over time, however, it became apparent that rather than a third-party system just knowing that it was authorized to access a person's online resources, it would be useful to have some identity information. Maybe knowing the person's email address, phone number, or postal address would help speed up the completion of an online shopping process. Companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google started adding custom implementations to allow access to this user info, and eventually OpenID Connect came along to formally provide the identity layer on top of OAuth. So, let's have a look at a more concrete example. Let's say that you are writing a web app. So this web app might be, for example, a, a conference management system, and there are going to be a number of features that you want to be able to allow people to do. So perhaps you want to be able to uh, create an event, or uh, if you're a speaker, then maybe you want to submit to their CFP. And perhaps you're a sponsor, and you want to log in and upload some assets, maybe a logo for the conference to use on their website uh, to show your support. These functions will all require a different level of user access as defined by an access control list. Now, but we don't want to have to deal with access control lists or password management or any of these other security concerns. So let's look at OAuth and OpenID Connect as a way to provide the authorization and identity information. When we first set up the web app in the OAuth provider, it's set up as an OAuth client. The OAuth service will be told uh, information about the client, such as a, a name and a callback URL, and it will then return or provide for the web application a client ID and a client secret. The client ID is essentially public information, uh, but the client secret is obviously a secret, must not be revealed from the web application, and is only used by the web app to authenticate itself to the OAuth provider. Now let's have a look at our user. We'll call her Alice. Alice comes along and wants to make use of the conference management system. So uh, from her browser, she makes a request to the web application. The web application realizes at this point that they don't know who she is. She needs to log in. So because we're using OAuth here for authentication and authorization, the web app will return to the browser a redirect request to send her to the OAuth service. Now, as part of this, the web application is going to include the client ID. And we're also going to include a number of scopes. Scopes are essentially permissions or requests uh, to grant information. So we're going to send two scopes in this time. We're going to send in profile, which is the standard profile request scope. But we're also going to send in open ID. And this is what tells the OAuth provider to enable that open ID layer and provide additional information about the user back to the web application. So when Alice's browser then redirects to the OAuth service, it will also include the client ID and the scope. Now, at this point, Alice may or may not already be logged in to the OAuth service. The OAuth service obviously needs to know who she is. If she's not logged in, the OAuth service is going to respond with a request for her to log in. The request will be probably a form for her to enter her username and password, and when she submits that information back to the OAuth service, she's then logged in with the service and the OAuth system knows who she is. Now, if Alice was logged in at this point already, then this probably wouldn't have happened. But in either case, at this point, the OAuth service is going to have a look at the scope and check with Alice that she is happy for the web application to get access to the OpenID information and to the profile. Alice will be shown a prompt asking to confirm whether she's happy for this to happen. And when she says yes, the OAuth service returns a response which includes an OAuth code. Now, this response is actually a redirect to the callback of the web application. So Alice's browser will then redirect to the web application to add the callback URL and include with it the auth code. Now, once the web application has the auth code, it can send it to the OAuth service along with the client secret and the client ID. 
This identifies the web application as being the intended destination for the information, and the auth code is what makes sure that to the authorization server that they are acting on behalf of Alice with Alice's permission. Once the auth service receives its request, it will return a token. And because one of the scopes in the request was for OpenID, it'll also return an ID token. Now, the ID token is a JSON web token. It has a header, a payload, and a signature. So the payload will have, at the very minimum, a subject, which is the person who's logged in, an issuer, which is the name of the OAuth provider, an audience, which is the client in question, an issued at timestamp, and an expiry time. It may also contain a nonce, uh, and additional requested information about the subject, such as name and email address. Finally, it's digitally signed using the signature, which means that the payload and header can be compared against that signature to make sure that nothing got changed in transit. So with this ID token, the web application now has enough information about Alice in order to seed a new account within the system. We don't need to worry about storing password credentials, but we've got potentially her email address, her name, and enough inf information for her to start using the conference management system. Looking at this diagram, there looks to be a lot of moving parts in this, but you'll probably find that your framework and language of choice have at least a couple of libraries that you can use to abstract a lot of this away and make your life a lot easier. So uh, I highly recommend uh, giving auth a try, uh, forgetting about passwords, and just getting on with your web application. Good luck. Looking at this diagram, it looks like there's a lot of moving parts, but you'll probably find that your library is closed at weekends, and therefore you're going to have to go and watch a movie.